If you ask me, I'll say antibiotics alongside painkillers are one of the most common medications you will have to administer as a registered nurse. Now, correct me if I am wrong. Now, in this video, I am going to be simplifying this term antibiotics. We'll talk about what they do, the different types, different classifications, examples, and what to know if you're a nurse taking care of someone who is taking antibiotics. So let's get into it. Hi, my name is Imolia Yobusari. I am a registered nurse and you're welcome to my YouTube channel. Here I talk about nursing and healthcare. And in today's video, just like I mentioned, I'll be simplifying antibiotics. Disclaimer, please, these videos I, I post on my channel are not a replacement for your lecturers or the notes of your lecturers. I'm not saying once you watch my video, don't go to class. What my videos do is to simplify these things and make it very, very easy for you to understand so that when you go to the exam or when you go to class, when you go back to read your textbooks, you clearly understand what you are reading. Okay, so let's go. Antibiotics is a term used to refer to medications that are used to treat bacterial infections. Note bacterial infections. These are different from antivirals used to treat viral infections as well as antifungals used to treat fungal infections. Infections come from different places. Not all infections are caused by bacteria, but infections caused by bacteria specifically are used, uh, are treated with antibiotics because I've seen a lot of students mixing up these three classes of medications. Please, they are different. They have different purposes. They combat different types of microorganisms. Now, these antibiotics can be broadly classified into two types, which are the bacteriostatic and the bactericidal. Now, from the words static and cidal, that should give you an insight to how they work or what they might be doing. So, bacteriostatic antibiotics, what they do is that they keep the bacteria static. They stop the growth, they contain it, they box it up so that it doesn't multiply or move about in your body. What bactericidal from the word cidal, you know, suicidal, they kill it completely. They, they like they kill it completely. So those two um, forms of or two classes that I mentioned is what every antibiotics can be grouped under. So first, let's talk about the bacteriostatic antibiotics. So just like I said, bacteriostatic antibiotics stops bacteria from growing or reproducing. They don't directly kill them. So the body's immune system is now responsible for clearing out the bacteria once these bacteriostatic antibiotics have done their work. And there are three major classes of antibiotics that fall under bacteriostatic, which are macrolides, tetracyclines, and sulfonamides. Now let's talk about each of these classes one after the other. So first, let's talk about macrolides. You see bacteria in it just like any other organism you know, animals or human know, we all need one thing called protein. The same way they'll tell you, oh, protein are bodybuilders, you need protein to grow. If you are wounded, eat a lot of protein. Bacteria needs protein to grow, to reproduce and spread in your body system and keep spreading that infection. So what microlides do is that they stop bacteria from making the proteins that is necessary for their growth and function. And very common examples of macrolides are azithromycin and erythromycin. Very simple, very direct. The protein that they need to function, they are stopped from making it. And because of that, they can grow. So once they are static, they become, you know, stopped from growing. The immune system takes over and clears them out. Very simple to understand. Okay, nice. Let's talk about the tetracyclines. And for my Nigerian base, my Nigerian sisters, you know that one now, uh, yellow and red. Yes, this one, this class of drug is what I'm going to be talking about. A lot of you are for very, very familiar with tetracyclines. So what they do is very similar to what macrolides do as well. They prevent bacteria from making proteins and stop their growth. Very common example of tetracyclines are doxycycline and tetracycline. So doxycycline is that green one. And see, these two medications, they, I identify them on the world by their colors. Green, one is green, then there's one that is red and yellow. So the, tra the traffic lights, red, yellow, and green. Those are, those are the three colors that come into tetracycline class that I always, always remember. So now let's talk about the sulfonamides. Now sulfonamides do not attack proteins like the two other 
um, bacteriostatic guys, which are tetracyclines and macrolides. What's of my attack now is folic acid. Remember when you go to the antenatal clinic, or if, if you've ever been around somebody that is pregnant, they'll tell you, oh, you need folic acid for your baby to grow well. So the same way we human beings also need folic acid. Bacteria also need folic acid to function, to cause those infections in your body and to keep them spreading. They need folic acid so this is what the sulfonamides stop them from being able to produce so basically sulfonamide stops bacteria from making folic acid which they need to grow and some very common examples of sulfonamides are sulfasalazine sulfisoxazole as well as sulfadiazine you see the way they are coming with words sulfur 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 you know what to do when you see them in the exams. I'm not saying that any drug that starts with the word sulfur is a sulfonamide, but there is a very high chance. So these prefixes and suffixes are ways that you can identify medications in your exam. So now let's talk about the bactericidal antibiotics. The bactericidal antibiotics, just like I earlier mentioned, can kill off bacteria. This one, they don't have mercy. They have their the bacteria like this. Bye, bye, bye. They attack it and they kill it. So there are about... Four classes of antibiotics that fall under this class, which are penicillins, cephalosporins, fluoroquinolones, and aminoglycosides. So now let's talk about how they work and the different examples of drugs that fall under each of these types. Let's talk about the penicillins. You see these penicillins there? They are not nice. Though. They are not nice at all. You see the way I'm talking about antibiotics as if I'm just in you. So now, if you remember your biology from secondary school or high school, whichever one it is, draw them in like square forms and you now say a uh, plant needs a uh, plant has cellular cell wall and uh, this one has plasma membrane this one this one you you know you always label those cell walls which is what gives bacteria some form of structure so what penicillin does is to stop protein synthesis in that cell wall not in the entire bacteria now in the cell wall and what happens the bacteria bursts and dies very aggressive form of combating bacteria, if you ask me. But what they do is that um, the cell wall, which gives the bacteria its structure, needs protein to remain that way. So once the protein synthesis stops, you know, the bacteria no longer has function, it bursts and dies off completely. This is how penicillin works. And some common examples of penicillin are amoxicillin and your regular, you know, penicillin medication. So these are very uh, common examples. Next class that I'm going to be talking about are the cephalosporins. Now, the way cephalosporins also work is very similar to penicillin. They also interfere with the bacterial cell wall, and that will make the bacteria very, very weak and unable to survive. A very common example of cephalosporin is your cephalexin and ceftriazone. Ceftriazone, not ketrazone. Ceftriazone, not ketrazone. People I'm talking to, they know themselves. Just before I move on, if you're enjoying this video, first give it a thumbs up so that YouTube knows that this video is valuable and push it out to other nursing students that might need the video. Secondly, if you're a nursing student and you're looking for a free place, a very free place to listen to audio tutorials, get quizzes, as well as you know get study plans that would help you to plan towards your council exams, like your final nursing exams, you can check out my website. I'll leave all the links to that in the description box below. There are so many things, resourceful materials that you will find on there that would be very, very useful to you. So let's now let's talk about the fluoroquinolones. Mind you, the way I am smiling and laughing while making this video and trying to bring examples that are very relatable is because I want you to understand. So if your lecturer doesn't explain antibiotics the way I'm explaining it, it doesn't mean that your lecturer is not a good lecturer. I am only trying to make it fun and simple. Now, how do fluoroquinolones work? How do they kill bacteria? So what fluoroquinolone does is that it interferes with the bacteria's DNA. And you know one thing about DNA, DNA is associated with replication. Your parents' DNAs were replicated to make you... you you uh, meet with your husband or your man you guys replicate your own dna's to make your own children so dna and replication they go hand in hand so without dna that means the bacteria cannot replicate itself so there won't be all this cell division or anything so what um fluoroquinolone does is that it prevents the bacteria from actually, um, it, it actually interferes with the bacterial dna sorry so it doesn't get to kill it copy itself 
it doesn't grow it doesn't spread and it dies off completely because dna is like the lifeline of anything like if, if there is an alteration in the dna there will be genetic mutation so obviously dna is like the lifeline of the bacteria so it attacks that particular lifeline the bacteria can no longer replicate or copy itself and it dies off and very common example of fluoroquinolones are ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin cipro <laughs> I'm very sure you are remembering your cipro drips from the word or word posting. Yes, those are fluoroquinolones. Finally, let us talk about the amino glycosides. Glycosides, just like every other bacteria, antibiotics, sorry, I've spoken about, also stop the bacteria from making proteins which they need for their growth and they end up dying. Very common example of amino glycosides are your gentamicin, which we popularly call gents. <laughs> Yeah, your gentamicin and your amikacin. So I believe with all the examples I've been given, you are getting some similarities in either the prefix or the suffix of the name of these um, antibiotics. So carefully studying them and know what type has what prefix, what type has what suffix will help you to be able to identify medications quickly for exam purposes or during OSCE. If you want to see more of my pharmacology videos, click on this playlist here and I'll see you in the next one.